Okay, let's do our second part for section 5.2, where we look at the geometric behavior of linear systems. Okay, um, so last time we looked at um, six cases of different kind of eigenvalues, and we saw what the how that affected the geometric behavior in the phase plane. Uh, so today I want to finish up looking at the special cases and I'll explain later what I mean by a special case. So the two cases we're going to look at today is um, a case where we have a zero eigenvalue with multiplicity one, i.e. we've got two eigenvalues, zero and r, and r is not equal to zero. And then the other case is two equal real non-zero eigenvalues, r1 and r2, so both equal to some r. There are two other special cases which we won't discuss today. One we discussed last time, and that's the case where we have complex conjugate eigenvalues with real part zero. This was case four of the last module. And the other case is when both eigenvalues are zero. Uh, this, uh, it's not that interesting, and if you if you are interested, you can look at it in um, it's in question twenty one of the section. Okay, so what happens when we've got real distinct eigenvalues, one of which is zero? Well, we know what the general solution looks like. Uh, it looks like a constant times e to the zero t, which is just one, right? So it's c one times um, the zero eigen uh, vector plus c2 e to the rt u2. So again, like before, we're going to let li be the infinite line spanned by the correspond uh, by its eigenvector. Now, any point on L1, remember this is the line spanned by the uh, zero eigenvector, is an equilibrium point. And we can just test this by just plugging it into the equation. So we have x prime, remember, is ax. Well, if we let x be uh, a constant multiple of the zero eigen vector, that's going to be on our, that's our point on line L1. Okay, we can move out the c because it's scalar multiple and it's commutative. But, so now we've got a acting on u1, but u1 is the zero eigen vector. So the action of a is to multiply by zero. So that means we get the zero uh, vector as the answer. And so that shows the derivative is zero. So that shows you that it's an equilibrium point. Now, for any point on L2, what happens depends upon the sign of R. If R is negative, then we're multiplying by a negative exponential. So the solution will move towards the origin along that line L2. Whereas if R is positive, it's going to move away from the origin along that line L2. Any other point, right, is going to move on a line parallel to L2 because any other point is a mixture of the zero eigenvector plus the R eigenvector, right? And so since the zero eigenvector part isn't going to do anything, the R eigenvector part is just going to multiply it by R in the direction of um, u2. Okay, so it's going to move along a point, or move along a line parallel to L2 towards the equilibrium point, which is the intersection of that line with the line L1. Okay, um, so the next, uh, oh, and of course, if R is, is positive, then it's going to move in the opposite direction. Okay, uh, the next two slides give a couple examples of these different cases. So here we've got the case where R is negative. So I've cooked up a matrix which has eigenpair values zero and minus one. And so there, there are the uh, eigenvectors. And so there's going to be equilibrium solutions along that one minus one eigenvector, which is the line y equals minus x. 
and all other solutions are going to move towards y minus x along a line of slope negative a half. Why is it a slope negative a half? Where well, you just look at the negative one eigenvector, you see that it's uh, 2y equals minus x. So it's got a slope of minus a half. So let's check that uh, now using maxima. Okay, so here is its phase plane, and you can see along the line y equals minus x, something funny is going along. It doesn't want to draw in vectors because they're zero vectors, right? And so um, I missed the line y equals minus x, and so we see a line, a solution coming and stopping when it hits that y equals minus x. Let's just check that the slope is um, negative a half. So if I put there, you can see that we dropped 10 in a run of 20. So that's a slope of minus a half. And then all the other ones we can, we can see, uh, they're all coming along that slope of minus a half and they're gonna stop at the line uh, y equals minus x. Of course, they don't actually ever reach the line y equals minus x, okay, because we know they can't, they can't actually reach that because of unique solutions. It asymptotically approaches uh, that point. Okay, so here's the next case where we've got uh, the positive eigenvalue. And so if you just compare it to the previous one, all I've done is I've just changed the entries to get um, there's the eigenvalues zero and one now, uh, and the eigenvectors have changed a little bit. Okay, so what do we predict? Uh, now the zero eigen uh, vector is along y equals x because it's one, one. So that's gonna be your equilibrium solutions and all other solutions move, are gonna move away from that line, y equals x, along a slope, of, a line of slope a half, again, because now the, the line is 2y equals x. Um, so let's go ahead and check that. Okay, so here is our uh, phase portrait, and again, you can see that something's happening along y equals x. Uh, it's not printing any, putting any vectors in because they're zero vectors. And let's just check that. Um, I could do something right. Uh, so if I click here, you can see that it, it stops at the line uh, y equals x and it's moving away, right? And we can see that the slope is a half this time. Perfect. Okay, what about the case when we have two equal real non-zero eigenvalues? Uh, and so if you remember there, there were two cases. So I'm gonna call the, uh, the situation where we have two equal real non-zero eigenvalues case B, and so we're gonna have case BA and case BB. Um, so the first, the simplest case is if there are two linearly independent eigenvectors um, with the same of the same eigenvalue, then every vector is an R eigenvector, since every vector in the plane can be written as a linear combination of those. So this we're just talking about in the two-dimensional case here. So it could be written as a linear combination C1 U1 plus C2 U2. And now we act on it by A. And so remember U1 and U2 are R eigenvectors. So the first question is just complete that proof. Okay, so what that shows is that since every vector is a R eigenvector, then every, so if you start at any point, it's gonna move along a straight line either towards the origin if R is negative or away from the origin if R is positive. And um, so here are two examples. So in four there, I talk about an example uh, where uh, 
minus one are the eigenvalues with multiplicity two. And I chose the simplest possible eigenvectors. By, by the thing above, I, I actually could have done used any two linear independent vectors, i.e. any two vectors which weren't linear multiples of each other, and I could have done the same thing. Okay, so what do we do? What do we predict? Well, we predict a stable equilibrium because the eigenvalues are negative, so we've got negative exponentials. Everything's going to go towards the origin, and everything's going to move in a straight line. Uh, let's check with maxima again. Okay, and so here we are. That looks as promised. Wow, so everything's coming in towards that origin there. Perfect. Okay, and here's the phase plane for the corresponding case where we have positive uh, equal eigenvalues and we have multiplicity two of the, uh, uh, we've got dimension two for the eigenspace, okay? And so, great, we see arrows, lines emanating from the origin, the moving away, so we're seeing this unstable equilibrium. So, as promised. Okay, and so we just looked at that example there, that's the matrix one, zero, zero, one, the identity, um, that's the one that has eigenpairs, it has eigenvalues just one, with multiplicity two, and it's got two linearly independent uh, eigenvectors. I could have used anything, I used just the simplest ones, and that's what we check, checked out. Okay, let's look at the more interesting case now, the case one where you're probably all worried about that u star, vector u star, but actually it doesn't actually turn up in the geometry, so we don't actually worry about it. So if there's only one linearly independent R eigenvector, then the solution looks like that, where we have to uh, we have to find that U star. Remember that was the the solution of A minus R I times um, U star equals U one. That's how we found U star. Okay, what happens here? Well, if R is negative, all solutions will tend uh, along L1 to or the origin, right? Because negative exponential. And um, there's no other eigenvector. So, but there's still negative exponentials multiplying by everything. So everything will tend to that line uh, to the origin. And actually everything ends up uh, tending to approach that line um, L1. Um, so let's do a couple of examples. The first example there uh, that has um, minus one as its only eigenvalue and it's only got one eigenvector, one, one. So that's at line y equals x again. So it's going to be a stable equilibrium, equilibrium with all solutions moving towards zero, zero and approaching that line y equals x. So let's, again, we're going to check with maxima. Okay, and here is the phase portrait. So, uh, so we've got y equals x. So if I try and, oh, if I click on y equals x, if I can do it right, we can see it's sort of going all, towards there, but what happens if we're not? Huh. So we see really no other evidence of any other line. So we're seeing this kind of, it starts out towards in the general direction of that line L1 and the origin. And we see that uh, sometimes it, it'll overshoot, but then it'll sort of come back and come in along that line L1. So that's what all those look like. Let's look at the other case. Okay, so for the other case, we need something with positive eigenvalues. So I just changed that matrix up a little bit. And so that only has one as its eigenvalues, and it's only got uh, one eigenpair, uh, one eigenvector, and so therefore one eigenpair. So that 
again it's at line y equals x and so this time we're going to have an unstable equilibrium with all solutions moving away from zero zero and veering from that line y equals x okay let's have a look at that again okay and so here it is so if i let's try hit it yep there's that line y equals x it's moving away and then you can see it sort of veering away going away from zero veering away from that line y equals x so it looks exactly the same as the last picture except all the arrows are reversed okay so the last topic for today um, so we notice that the geometry has been um, determined by the eigenvalues of the matrix a and and also the eigen uh, vectors but the eigenvalues are determined by the trace and determinant um, so for example the discriminant uh, well, that should be trace squared minus four times the determinant uh, determines whether the eigenvalues are real or complex conjugate. Um, an equilibrium is a saddle point if and only if the determinant is negative, right? That, that's the determinant is negative means the eigenvalues have opposite signs. And so if we just put all the information we've just sort of gone over, we can put it into that table there. So this is all the information that we learned from um, uh, module nine. So the other question I want to ask you, the module question is how would you extend the table to include the four cases we did today? Uh, by that I mean uh, the two different types of cases in uh, case A and um, two cases in type B, not between the, the trouble is <laughs> the trace indeterminate can't distinguish between um, uh, whether you've got two linear independent eigenvectors or only one. Okay, for that you need that extra bit of information, the dimension of that eigenspace. But um, what I mean by is um, the case where the you've got uh, two eigenvalues equal and negative or two eigenvalues equal and positive. Okay, so when we put that, encode that information using the trace determinant plane, we get this kind of nice picture right here. So now I can explain what I mean by special cases. So, um, all the cases that we looked at on Friday um, are open regions in the trace determinant plane. Uh, the only one that wasn't is the center. Remember that was where the real uh, part of the eigenvalues was zero. Okay, um, That's actually uh, the y-axis uh, that we have there. The upper y-axis actually. Um, uh, when uh, the discriminant is, is zero, that means the determinant equals trace squared divided by four. So we're on that parabola, that dotted parabola there. Um, the, the cases that we did today were the, the cases on the parabola, that was case B, and the horizontal axis is case A. Uh, that's why I say the center, that's the, the y-axis. Uh, that should be a special case, but it it was simple to deal with, so we we, we dealt with it on Friday. Um, in the case where there's two zero eigenvalues, that's the origin, right? That's where the trace is zero and the determinant is zero. Okay, and so um, so really the, the things that are really important are the open regions, those five open regions, the saddle, the sink, the source, the spiral sink, and the spiral source. Um, and that's going to be what we're going to look at when we look at nonlinear systems. And we want that open, uh, we want a region, right? Because 
what we can do with nonlinear systems is we can linearize them at the origin. And so in some small neighbor, neighborhood, it's going to look like um, a linear system. And so if the linear system that's linearized is one of those five, then we can say, aha, uh -huh, the nonlinear system has that type of equilibrium. Whereas if it's a special case and we go to the nonlinear, we linearize, um, we can't really tell. So it, it's kind of like the second derivative test. If the second derivative equals zero, you don't know whether you've got a max or a min. You have to look in, in closer. It's kind of the same kind of thing. Uh, the other nice thing that you can do with the trace determinant plane is you can do some sort of uh, bifurcation analysis. So I'll give you an example of that in the next slide. So let's say we have that matrix alpha minus one, one, one. Uh, it's a matrix for our system. And let's find the bifurcation values of alpha. Okay, where we look at our matrix. So we just need the determinant and the trace. Uh, the trace is alpha plus one. The determinant is alpha plus one. Okay, so we're just interested in the line determinant equals trace. So the matrix uh, the A is going to lie along that the matrix uh, given by that family A is going to lie along that line. Okay, and so when do the when does um, that line determinant equals trace intersect with the special cases? Well, it's at zero zero and four four. Okay, uh, and if we think about what that means for alpha, that means alpha equals minus one and three. So there are bifurcation values. Um, minus one is bifurcation, and that's where the equilibrium goes from, we just look at the open regions, right? It goes from a spiral source to a saddle. And when alpha equals three, we're up there, and that's when we go from a spiral source to a source. And that's our bifurcation. So with the bifurcations, you never worry about the special cases because they are, <laughs> they're dealing with kind of like equality. It's like when you go from one region to the next region, that's when uh, you're interested in your bifurcations. Okay, that's our module.